Welcome everybody to another episode of the Kitty Games Podcast here on Game Wisdom, where we're some of the art and science of games. We are back right in the middle or the midst of Memorial Day weekend. I know holidays don't really exist for uh, people in game dev, but uh, we are here to wrap up our talk about the FPS genre at long last. Next time we'll start our 30 uh, episode coverage on the Souls Lake, and that way yes. we'll be good until like sometime in 2025 but exactly joining me my co-host from a casual game studio joshua reyes how are you doing this it's reasonably hot memorial day weekend here it is it's well let's see what what we're 63 and it's actually raining here in ohio so it's not not too bad but not ideal like barbecue weather or anything like that mm. um but uh, other than that, it's pretty good. Uh, this week, actually, uh, I was like alerted last minute that it's summertime now. So it's like the last week for kiddos. Uh, last week, so we were getting them all that. So uh, dev time was definitely crunched this week. But other than that, I'm doing good. And I, I think, Josh, I heard from a, a little birdie that you're working on a new book now. Yep, I finally started typing up the uh, Souls Light book. It has yes. finally begun. I have just under two months to get it done i'm it hoping it will be yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, i'm hoping it won't be as bad as the rpg book but then after that it's shooters which i'm assuming is going to be at least like eighty thousand words to talk about the fps right. genre <laughs> and then you can easily reference what this 80 part series we did on shooters already yeah. and just have that playing in the background <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh i think with that let us get started so for this week, it's been a very long and uh, shooty road in terms of discussing the genre. We start with the originals to the kind of Half-Life spectacle shooters, so RPG shooters, and we got to boomer shooters last week. So for today, we're going to kind of do both a uh, kind of final wrap-up of some of our favorite shooters, and we're going to try and talk about like where the genre is now and where could it be going in the future. So at the end of our show last week, we mentioned uh, the Wolfenstein reboot, and we never really talked about that one. So I figured that could be a good place to start. And it's kind of surprising, too, because I remember like, a time like no one, you couldn't escape coverage of Wolfenstein. I forget like the full name of them. That was the, was that the New Order? Uh, the New yes. Colossus. Yeah, the New Order and the New Colossus. Yeah, and Wolfenstein the New Order came out in 2014, and then Wolfenstein the New Colossus came out in 2017. 2017, wow. Feels like they would be, like, older at this point. Definitely, definitely. Um, and I was actually, like, looking back at them, because um, the New Colossus is probably one of my, one of my favorites in mm -hmm. the series. Uh, just... Story-wise, it was actually, like, the most intriguing and gripping, mm -hmm. and uh, the set pieces were really good, and uh, I just thought, like, it, it brought a lot of what the uh, first reboot did or, and perfected some of the mechanics, and it felt really well. Which ones did you play uh, out of the reboots? I played uh, the New Order, or I played the first one. I played the expansion to that one. That was when they added in like all like the zombies and stuff back in. Yes. And I played about two hours of the uh, co-op one. And okay. That one I did not enjoy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did not touch the co-op either. No. <laughs> Never played I, uh, the second one or the new the new, the actual sequel. The new Colossus. Yeah. Yeah, I do. If you have some spare time. To play it, I do recommend uh, that you you play through it. It's it's for such like um, the premise of the game, of course, is so like jumpy, the sharky, right? It's just it's it's over the top, and somehow they created a story like you care about the characters. There's a lot of world building, and you would not expect any of that, right, in a Wolfenstein 3D game. And somehow, of course, the the gameplay loop is really good. It has um almost a Skyrim-esque upgrade system, or was that the first one, I believe? So if you, like, use specifically, like, assault rifles, then, like, the, pit, the, the perks you earn would go to that, right? So, like, depending on your play style, it would upgrade those certain ones. So it was, like, 
the skill tree was unique, very pared down, not a lot of heavy RPGs. Uh, and to me, it was just one of those like really surprising because reboots are hard to do. And it's basically like they threw everything out of the window, threw it all in the trash and maybe like picked out some of the very good pieces of what made it work. And it really works really well. So mm -hmm. I do recommend if you haven't played the new Colossus or at least just watch a little review over the story or something like that, because it's it's quite amazing uh, for uh, I mean, of, of all the games that I've played, that one my wife was most intrigued with the story. Uh, and so that has a lot to say about uh, a single player campaign shooter, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yep. And if I remember, I know they had like the kind of like weapon challenges that you use to unlock new perks. And the first yes. one was like, uh, get 10 headshots in yes. five seconds, or throw a grenade and kill four enemies in one uh, blast kind of thing. And yeah, the first game was very intriguing for its story. Again, it's very tricky to do like a, you know, alternate, you know, what if the Nazis won World War right. II kind of thing. And I think they pulled it off reasonably well. And I think definitely credit to the voice acting and the writing. They made uh, Blasowitz really com uh, convincing or uh, very intriguing. Uh, the bad guy who was played by that one guy from Star Trek, whose name I do not remember was also really good as the villain. They avoided having, you know, Robo Hitler as the final right. boss. Right, definitely. I mean, it was it's it's really amazing how they were able with such even like I I don't remember, I believe there was some controversy because of the content in the game, mm -hmm. but they were able to like the writing was able to really dance that line and present it, you know, this alternate universe if this really did happen. Mm -hmm. In such a convincing way. And of course, making BJ Blazkowicz like even a likable character, someone that I would want to know about, again, is another feat in itself. Uh, and then besides that, of course, the shooting was, you know, the game, became, you know, the mm -hmm. shooting was on point. Everything else was on point. I, I just think overall, like very, very solid uh, entry. Mm -hmm. And to, I mean, I, I can't, I, you know, it's hard to. Uh, you know, that in Doom, you know, remakes uh, or reboots, I'm trying to think that has pulled it off more successfully, I think, to my uh, taste, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those games that did a really solid job of kind of giving you like very different feelings or different level designs. Everyone remembers, right. you know, the whole train section where you have to pretend to be a Nazi. Yes. The actual camp itself. I think the camp itself is where probably a lot of the controversy stem from. Yes, yes. And yeah, it's a very tough line, I think, for developers to walk. Especially when you're dealing with not exactly, you know, quote-unquote realistic, but, you know, it's just realistic enough that, you know, your mind can kind of uh, draw the lines of what's going on in it. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, and, and again, as you mentioned, like, I, I, I specific, you know, we've talked about games before and, and, and campaign shooters before, and do you remember the levels? Do you remember the set pieces? Mm -hmm. And so much in this game still stands out to me to this day, even from the new Colossus. Um, and, it's, and it's really hard to do that. Like, I mean, from Doom 2016, I can't say I remembered all, this, all the set pieces mm -hmm. and, and all the level design, more so from Doom Eternal. Um, which we'll get to, I think we're going to get to mm -hmm. later, um, more so from Dune Eternal. But again, like the world, I, I really felt like I was in that world. And so much credit to the level design, the writers, uh, the speech, you know, the, 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 actor, the voice actors and everything. It was quite a feat. Mm -hmm. And there really isn't anything much else to say about that. We only we just like keep praising it. But yeah, right. like the hope area was very memorable. If yes. I'm, I'm trying to remember, like, were there any other games that did, like, or at least in the FPS genre, that did, like, that kind of, like, hub structure? I mean, the, didn't, the, like, the Division kind of have a little, but they yeah. kind of had a hub structure, but, I mean, not like that, where, like, it was an FPS, and, and then the, the characters built in there, everything, you know, things changed, it was very dynamic. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't think of another one that, that pulled it off, did it, or even pulled it off to that, that you know, degree of quality. Mm-hmm. You know, where I actually cared back to go to a hub world, because how often do you want to go back to the hub world sometimes? <laughs> yeah. And it's a really good example, I think, of how a great story can really elevate a game. 
Because, I mean, the gunplay was on point. If they could just kept it, the gunplay would have been a reasonably good game. But the different set pieces, you go to the moon at one point and fight space yes. Nazis. Which yes. is, there's a sentence right there. And, <laughs> again, it kept it really well in terms of some of these areas. I guess, I, as a quick question, what did you think of, like, kind of, like, the quasi like open world levels i know there are several levels that are just like a very wide map yeah like okay you need a complete objective here 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 and you know however you do that is up to you um t to me like i think it felt a little off-putting for the pace of the game mm -hmm. right um like it felt like it kind of slowed me down because i felt like the game was more uh, almost theme, not really theme parky, but kind of theme parky in the way it progressed you. And then I felt like that was like a slow down. And I would have preferred, due to the quality of the narrative and the story, uh, maybe it would have just like pushed me along further instead of giving me this large open world to kind of slow down the story. I don't know. How'd you feel about it? I thought it was okay, but I think the game was at strength storing like the more like linear map design or you know maps yeah. that kind of like guide you towards each of the yes. one of the major things yeah because you know usually we we would be complaining about that but the game was so uh, well versed in pushing you forward through the story literally um that like it i think it almost felt like they were they felt like they needed to be put the open world design in there uh or some open worldness because otherwise it would be lacking and of course, like we've talked about that before, if you're just kind of shoehorning in something in, it's going to show and not really feel. So to me, it felt a little out of place. Um, mm -hmm. What did you think of, I know, did you play the DLC for the first one? I did not play the DLC for the first one, no. Okay. One of the things they did was like the first like quarter or the first like major sections of the game were like focused more on stealth than they were on shooting. You had to break out of the prison. And then it kind of turned into like your more traditional shooter at that point. And I thought that was a very interesting way of kind of breaking up the kind of flow of that game. It was more like a, the original Metal Gear in a way than it was a wow. Wolfenstein game. Impressive. <laughs> but I'm trying to, is there anything else about Wolfenstein before we kind of jump forward? Uh, let's see here. I, I, I really like give the new colossus a shot i think it i think if all the ones i think it's probably the like the neatest story if you haven't and it's a really good example of like what you, of, of how much a story can elevate like a shooter campaign right you know like there's very few a single player shooter campaigns so it's a good example uh also a good example of a reboot about things to keep from a lore so it's a good study in that regard uh, other than that, Josh, I think uh, that sums up that okay. one. All right. So with that, let's jump forward and talk about Doom Eternal. Then we'll kind of talk a little bit more about like what's going on with shooters like this year and in 2022. So in tw it has it really been three years since Doom Eternal came out? I can't. Oh my gosh! I can't believe it's been that fast. Or yet, yeah, March what? 20 of 2020, it came out. Uh, I we're doing to that we do we're doing this to ourselves like every show now yeah. consistently <laughs> <laughs> yes but in three short years ago doom eternal was released as it was in a way kind of like a spiritual take or spiritual sequel to doom 2 which doom 2 of course took place on earth the whole tagline was hell on earth there but doom eternal was certainly not like that game it was certainly not like doom 2016 and perhaps, like, the greatest litmus test for what you consider, what you think about FPSs today, is whether you preferred Doom 2016 or you prefer Doom Eternal. So, uh, I guess uh, let's rip that band-aid off. And I'll go first this time, so I'll, uh, okay. I'll take okay. the slings first. <laughs> okay. For me, I prefer Doom Eternal than Doom 2016. Doom 2016, for me, is very much like you know, the shooter shooter. It's a very contemporary take. It's something that we've played before. The push forward combat, of course, is its one unique driving element. But it's still, you know, that same kind of shooting we've all come to know and love. Doom Eternal for me is, and I've said this before, it's basically what if we took like a Devil May Cry and, you know, 
jammed it into Doom. It's more technical focus. There's a lot more thinking going on with it. And it's where I think that division comes in in terms of what is the flow state of Doom Eternal versus Doom 2016. So I can ramp out that for like another 20, 30 minutes, but I'll throw it over to you. Like, what, which Doom did you prefer? Just hands down Doom Eternal. Um, first off, like, the hell, like, the level design, um, to me, like, the, the cities, like, the hellscapes and everything, it, 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 it just, it felt so much more like what Doom really, like, was. Like, of all the Dooms that were made, I felt like that was what they were trying to aim for in the level design, right? I mean, literally, like, when you start off, you start off, I think, when you first hit the city and you land on the, you know, destroy Earth, you know, those, like, caco demons flying up, mm -hmm. some giant demon, like, right before you. <laughs> and, and like, even though there's push-forward combat, I, I stood there, like, looking at all the environmental detail. There's, like, demon octopuses hanging off of a certain thing with tentacles, and it's just, like, it is so detailed and highly detailed. And, like, if you compare that to 2016, right, which is kind of, like, just, like, cubes and boxes and crates and and uh you know things like that and and of course like it was like 2016 was really the like they were really trying out the mechanics right they were like okay let's let's almost a gray box test of the mechanics right uh in a way and then they finally in doom eternal took it they had all the environmental design um just on point just amazing to look at i mean we're talking like uh i mean like deeper than dark, like like Souls games almost, and like how detailed they would get, I believe. Um, and then the only issue I had, you were talking about the flow state, and I felt like toward the end of the game, I was doing a lot more juggling uh, between mm -hmm. weapons and running out of ammo than I did in the first game. So, so how did you feel like um, with like kind of like the weapon changes between 2016 to Eternal? Um, do you think it was I'm all in good, or was there some bad mm. with it? I do think they may have went a little too far with kind yeah. of the, you know, weapon counter specific enemy type kind yeah. of thing. A lot, I, like when you look at like super master level play of Doom Eternal and by extension Ultra Kill, it felt like a lot of that play is just mashing the weapon swap button. So you're going, like, gun to shotgun to rock launcher to arbalist. Yes. In maybe the span of two seconds. Yeah. And to me, like, and I'm, this is going to get a little weird, but I'm drawing parallels to the fighting game genre at that level. Yes. Like, it felt, it didn't feel like I was playing, like, an action game, or it didn't feel like I was playing an FPS at that point. It felt far more, I think, micro or APM yeah, yeah. intensive than I would have liked. And it, I'm trying to think, there's another example that's like popped in my head. Oh, yeah. There was that beam up that I talked about. This would be like last year that was like kind of inspired by fighting games. And I had that same kind of issue in that one where it kind of, I think, got a little too far away from, you know, how the genre is supposed to feel. Like, if you could, I think one of the things I would have loved if there's a way to like do. You know how a lot of FPSs and third-person shoes have, like, the slowdown when you're going to, like, your quick menu to swap weapons? Yes, yes. That would have been, I think, a huge deal for someone like me to try and get through that. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Like, toward the end, when I was just, like, you know, swapping back and forth, I was just like, this is a lot. And, and yeah, they give you a lot of tools and they give you a lot of utility, but, like, just... That at that point, I was like, oh, it's a little too much. And I can understand like, OK, maybe they're you mentioned that Devil May Cry point where it's like, well, we want the S level players to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. But I felt that even like on, you know, I play easy mode. I don't have too much time. Mm -hmm. And I felt like even on easy mode, there was it was just too much micromanagement in the way of that. And it kind of interrupted my flow. So, again, I wasn't even playing a shooter at that point. Right. Like. I was just merely swapping weapons. So, <laughs> yeah, other, that's probably my biggest gripe about it. Um, but again, like, uh, so if we start praising again, the AI, I think the AI advancements from 2016 
to Eternal uh, were, were, were quite well. Like, I've really enjoyed, again, you know, how they did that queuing system, right? You know, it was like, it, it's, it's time for the imp or it's time for this. And they would switch back and forth. Uh, they seemed a lot more mobile and to be able to, like, because we have, there's a lot of verticality in the levels, right? So they're able to, like, traverse very well and, like, also queue themselves up on the environment, which is a bit difficult to do. Uh, mm -hmm. and AI programming, and I think they pulled that off very well. So uh, the AI feels so active and alive and engaged with you in the fight. Um, let's see, where else were we? I don't know, Josh lost my place here. <laughs> yeah, and different... Uh, go back to what you said about, like, the environmental and level design. Like, it, I think one of the big things was that it made the levels feel more, like, playgroundish than in Doom 2016. Like, there was a lot of stuff going on in some of those levels with the grappling around. I mean, you could wall uh, hang and wall jump, and then let's not forget the whole use of the air dash for just a lot yes. of horizontal movement. The first time I, I, I saw, like, a yellow pole, and I was like, am I supposed to jump and grapple on that thing? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> They're adding parkour, and then I got to the Mario level, and... <laughs> That was kind of fun. I did enjoy it, though. It was fun. Mm -hmm. And I played through the whole thing on Nightmare because oh I really gosh, wanted yes. to punish myself and go yes. through that. And it is a challenge. And again, it's a game that when it's firing on all cylinders, it is perhaps one of the best FPS experiences of the last like five to seven years, easily. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, I did feel like it got a little button heavy. I think the problem for me is that trying to remember, like, what keys do what in the middle of all the dashing, jumping, grenading, and shooting just got, a, like, a little too much. Okay, wait, which key was the Arbalist? No, that's the rocket launcher. Oh, let me hit that one. No, that's the rail gun. And <laughs> everything is happening all at once in it. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, so that, that would probably only be the... Uh, um lack of praise i would have for that game <laughs> and we do have to mention the marauder but before we get to him in terms of the secret design i thought the game did a really well done job of handling secrets it told you like right at the start okay this level's gonna have da, 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 da. if you want to do it go for it when you finish the entire level the game just says you know what you beat the level all the secrets revealed Go get them if you want. If not, just move on. And I think to me, like, that is one of the best ways of handling, you know, collectibles and secrets and all that. Like, make it something that if someone wants to spend the time, let them. But at the same time, you know, someone can just, you know, get it done and then move on. Like, it wanted to give the player or make it so they got 100%. And I think that's a really good strategy for a lot of these games, rather than, you know, the old... You need like five guys and three videos in order to figure out how to get this door open. Right, definitely. No, I think they handle it very well, and I love the collectability system in it. I really can't add much more to it, Josh. You summed it up well there. <laughs> so, uh, with that, the Marauder is definitely the one that, when we talk about the difference in flow states between Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal, the Marauder is kind of the uh, sore thumb or the sticking point for a lot of people. And I need to do a critical thought about how it really defines kind of like how the difference in flow has happened in action games. But the Marauder itself is a fight that it feels for a lot of people like the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah. There are a lot of people who despise that Marauder fight, who consider, you know, like one of the worst bits of game design in the game and all that. For me, I can see their point. But I think it also goes to exemplify like how Doom Eternal is not really like an FPS, not in the same way as Doom twenty six or Doom twenty sixteen or a lot of the other FPSs. Like it's a game that it requires you to be constantly thinking, yeah, and like we more, said, like a lot more chess PC. Yeah, very chess PC. And the Marauder is just, like, the perfect example of that. And for the people watching us, Lyra or Core, I want to know what your thoughts are. Did you love the Marauder fights, or did you hate them? But it yeah, seems like please, those are the only know. two, like, opinions that go with it. Mm -hmm. But it is, again, that fight that when he shows up, everything else kind of gets put aside. And we've seen action games that have those kinds of enemies. 
you know, like the one enemy that will buff everyone around, or when they introduce like a super elite enemy, like something that everything else kind of goes behind or goes behind the scenes, and this guy takes precedent over what you need to do if you want any chance at winning. And I think with the fact that I have more of an action game background rather than being a hardcore first person shooter fan, I think that's kind of where I like it didn't bother me as much as I think other people. But what did you think of it? Yeah, I, I you know, it's 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 I think it's almost like it was like taking a God of War mm -hmm. enemy and throwing it to Doom, right? And and it kind of uh I see your point, how you're like, as an action game, and same for me, like a mm -hmm. massive action game fan, um, it didn't really bother me, but I can see people's gripes is how it immediately stopped, because the game is go, 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 and mm -hmm. this one is stopping you and forcing you to think, right? You have mm -hmm. to think, how am I going to do this? Um, I think the first encounter, it's just him solo, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's when it gets, it, it really gets bad when it's him, and there's Lots of other stuff, but, um, you know, your first encounter with him is, is I think is fun, right? Like it's really good, but the problem is he kind of breaks the dichotomy of how the other enemies work. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what people's issues with it are me personally. I, I like it. I like that. There's actually like something that, uh, just a little bit different and just to change it up and to spice it up. And even if it kind of, like we don't have to be pushing forward the whole time. Maybe let's mm -hmm. stop and think because there is this different enemy and you say it's very common. There's always an enemy that comes and raises something from the dead or spawns mm -hmm. other things like that's a very common trope in games. So it's understandable to see it in coming me personally. I mean, I, I thought it, it fit well and it made sense, especially for doom eternal. Mm -hmm. Um, but I can understand people's gripes. My gripes with it are very small. I think the pros of the Marauder outweighed the cons to me personally, but. Mm -hmm. Yep. And like you said, like it, it's designed to kind of break the traditional flow of an FPS. And if you're not used to that, it does feel like that moment where, okay, what am I supposed to do? Why is this guy not taking any damage? And I think part of the issue, as you said, is that when he shows up, it kind of breaks the entire like mental chess that you're mm -hmm. playing with the other enemies. When you're fighting the other enemy, it's, you know, it's use grenade launcher on a spider demon, throw grenade at Kako demon, Arbalist on this guy. And you're able to kind of do that like at your own leisure. When the Marauder shows up, basically everything else does not matter, and you have to fight him in order to kind of then regain that flow. But again, all the while you're fighting him, everybody else around is just throwing fireballs and trying to get at you. Yeah, and the wolf, his wolf, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> just summons the wolf. <laughs> I think the if there was a mistake with that fight, I think it's the AI behavior that you have to be within like a specific distance of him in order to actually fight him because in yes. a game where you have super wide environments where you're constantly moving dashing and jumping around if you're too far away he kind of like throws his axe on his wolf if you're too close he just runs up and you know punches you with his shield so you have to be at like that perfect distance every yeah. time and again it's one of those things where if you're an expert at that game you know, that's already hard code in your brain. You know exactly where to stand, where to be moving, super shotgun, arbless super shotgun, and you can probably kill him in two cycles. But if you're a new player, or someone who's not used to that, it just feels so awkward. Wait, I'm supposed to be running around, but I can't run too far, but now I'm running too close. And now he's mm -hmm. just summoning wolves, and why can't I get him to attack me in the Somebody one wolves. exact way? And I'm sure a few people probably threw their controller the first time they try to use the BFG, and he just shrugged off the BFG he's blast. So <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, wasted all of them on him. That should take him out. Now nah, he blocked all of them, man. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, go ahead. I was going to say, like, to Smith's come, yeah, and then the DLC, they throw two of them at the same time. 
And then when uh, they did the, uh, well, I forget the name, not the Nightmare level, but, like, when they had, like, the Super Remix Master level. There you go. They had Master level. You had to fight two of them in an enclosed environment with fog, so you can't see where everything is coming from. And it's just like, okay, here you go. Enjoy. <laughs> you beat it, right, Josh? Yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Oh, my. Uh, but... <laughs> marauders were ridiculous but so rewarding to beat yeah i think they were they were very rewarding to beat and again it kind of just reminded me like as an action fan it didn't fit out i was like okay they put a god of war enemy in here they're clearly breaking up the flow and it made sense to me and it was just like understanding the boss uh so but again i can definitely see other people's gripes about it but mm -hmm. Uh, it's common to want to break up the flow a little bit and uh, change it so things don't get so repetitive. Mm -hmm. When I do my video on flow states, I'm going to bring up Sekiro and how the Marauder really is like equal or equates to some of the fights in the Sekiro game. So I'm really going to like uh, <laughs> draw a lot of people into that one. <laughs> which which fight in the Sekiro? Which one? The monkey I'm, one? <laughs> I'm thinking of like a Genshiro and uh eason at the end but yeah like oh yeah it is such a again there's a really good uh conversation about action design that if we start talking about that we'll be here for that's a good 50 minutes just on that one topic yeah let's finish up shooters first yeah because <laughs> we're starting the 120 episodes soul series next saturday yeah. right josh mm -hmm. yeah yeah just 24 hour stream we'll get through like five of them in uh one day there will be perfect. one day <laughs> mm -hmm. I guess to keep with Doom Eternal for a few more minutes, so we talked about the level design, we talked about the enemy design, uh, to Smith's comedy, yeah, like, the bosses, I felt, were, like, the weakest aspect of Doom Eternal, at least from an enemy design standpoint, they didn't really, and when we talk about Ultra Kill in a few minutes, we'll come back to interesting boss designs there, but the Doom Eternal fights, I think, felt a little too, like, railroady in how you were supposed yeah. to fight them. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the bosses were just railroadies, like you would say. What I did like, though, it, going back to the enemy design, I like the armor fracturing on it. Mm -hmm. um, and it has have you, you've, you've spoke about before, like, damage tells how you can actually tell if you're damaging the enemy mm -hmm. through animation and stuff like that. And to me, that was very satisfying, like seeing armor chip off and, and, and uh, having the enemy react. So I thought it was very juicy and a nice little extra thing to it so that was really nice for the enemy design yeah i mean like how you could like if you you know throw a grenade or you shoot a sick grenade at, like the arachno demons like gun turn you can blow that up and then he doesn't have that attack anymore exactly exactly love that part um oh yeah did we go over the genius of uh wrote it down here uh using glory kills for health right yeah, but, yeah. Uh, chainsaw for ammo and then also they added the flame Flame and that Belcher. was for well, flame belcher for for armor. Mm -hmm. So just that mechanic. Also, I don't know. If, did they have uh, the flame belcher in uh, 2016? I don't think so. I think it was just glory kill and chainsaw in the first. That's one. right. That's right. So adding that three and then dividing it into mm -hmm. into health, armor, and ammo, I thought was pretty neat. So, yeah. and I think it really does best. Uh, exemplify the push forward combat that doom 2016 mm -hmm. sailed to do it i think this is the only game i play where it truly felt like armor was a second health uh meter yes rather in a lot of games armor is like that thing where it's nice to have but you can never really easily replenish it maybe there's like a secret over there that gives you more armor in this game it's oh no i'm out of armor Flame belch chain, or my favorite, then you can like flame belch into a chainsaw, and then you kind of recover both armor and ammo at the same time. There you go. There you go. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no. It, the how how the armor actually mattered in this game. Uh, you know, they added it, and it actually worked instead of just being something that you never get before. Uh, yeah, it was definitely cool. So like everything kind of mattered in the game. Mm -hmm. One thing that I want to ask you about, and also for chat. What did you think of kind of like the RPG upgrades where they had like the different passives you could equip on and like there's a kind of like passive tree that unlocked like different perks like uh, barrels would regenerate so you can blow them up or 
perform a glory kill from further away, perform a glory kill faster, that, those kinds of things. Yeah, I, I, I'm cool with that. I think that was pretty good. I like passives. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a, as an MMO fan, anytime you get cool passives, you just geek out. So I was cool with that. Uh, how'd you feel about them? I, I thought they were okay. I'm not a fan, again, like when like the passives feel like so important that you need to take them. So it didn't really feel like I was like building like part like customization. It just felt like I was just, you know, becoming, you know, the full version of the Doom God. Got at that you. Point. Got you. So you were instead of customizing, you were doing what needed to be done mm -hmm. to achieve the game. Understand. Got yeah. you. Uh let's see, I still had I had a few more. The meat hook. Did we talk about the meat hook? No. But yeah, that was a, re you know, the super shotgun, you can grapple to an enemy. It also, again, like the weapon design in Doom Eternal is very smart. And how every weapon feels differently, each weapon has its own specific utility to it. Like, this was one of the things that we talked about when we were discussing Painkiller and uh, Bulletstorm. That every weapon had a purpose to it. Like, it didn't just feel like, here's the shotgun. Now here's the bigger shotgun. Now here's the bigger, bigger shotgun. It, like even just like the different shotguns in Doom Eternal were different. Your single shotgun had the grenade launcher attachment. The super yep. shotgun, of course, had the meat hook. Me you could upgrade yep. the meat hook to like set enemies on fire, so that when you get close enough, you get an armor boost when you <laughs> blast them with it. Man, I wonder what Dev was thinking that he was like, yeah, let's add things to it. Sets them on fire. That's great, great mm -hmm. idea. <laughs> oh man. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, oh, we definitely, in terms of the game, did you play the DLC to Doom Eternal? No. No, oh, man, not my. enough time. The DLC for Doom Eternal is very interesting. And for Chad and people watching this record, I want to know if you played through the DLC as well. The DLC is kind of like a tale of two very different games. The first DLC felt like what if we just made DLC for the triple S rank Doom Eternal players? It is monstrously difficult. This oh, is wow. where it's like, okay, we're going to throw two Cyber Demons, and then we're going to throw five Snake Enemies, and we're going to throw four Kako Demons, and we're going to throw another Cyber Demon at you. Oh, you finished that? Here's a Marauder just to round out the rest of this arena fight for you. <laughs> And it just felt like pain on top of pain. And this is when they introduced the, um, I think this is where they started adding more of the buff totems. So it's like, hey, we're going to throw all these enemies at you, and now they're immortal until you find that one thing in the environment that you have to kill before you can actually start fighting everything else. Side tangent. Like, when they, okay, when there's a game and it's like Hardcore Nightmare Challenge, and you like enter it and you're like, is this even possible? Did they actually play test this? Did they see if it was doable? <laughs> like, do you ever wonder that? <laughs> Sometimes I do, especially with some of the indie games I play, like the highest difficulty. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is when they go, okay, here's two Marauders. Oh, you enjoyed them? Here's a buffed up Marauder. So now he's even more powerful. Have fun there. And you're not you're not selling me on no, it, I'm not. <laughs> and yet it felt, and I've said this in my double review that if I stopped playing the DLC there, I will probably consider like a failure because it just felt way too punishing. Like it, it was one of those DLCs that again, like instead of adding more interesting things to do, it was just let's just keep adding difficulty on top of difficulty and uh... so on. The second DLC. Excuse me. I think is far superior. Like this is where it felt like okay, now they're actually doing interesting things. Like the instead of just capitalizing on here's just a arena fight that feels like five arena fights in one, we're gonna have one that's all about you freezing enemies. Here's one where it's all about just picking up uh, the berserker power and just going to town. Like it felt far more interestingly designed. And more importantly, this is the DLC where they introduced a new power in the form of this kind of hammer. And what the hammer does is, if you kill an enemy with it, it multiplies the resources they would drop. So, if the enemy's on fire and you kill them with the hammer, they'll drop like double or quadruple armor pieces. 
It's also a weapon that allows you to stun any enemy who gets hit by it. So this added another dimension to the Marauder fights, where you could go Super Shotgun into Arbalus, into the Hammer, mm -hmm. to then stun lock them a second time, to then allow you to do another Super Shotgun into an Arbalus. So the people who mastered that, it made the Marauder fights even easier Easy. and yeah. faster to do. It did also introduce the nightmarish enemies of these ghosts that would possess enemies and made them stronger, which was even another as we had to deal with. But I felt it was a really good counter by allowing, by giving the player more tools. Like, the first DLC, there was no, they did not introduce anything new in terms of upgrades or things to get around. The second one did, and I felt it was a much stronger game for it. And I would have loved to play through the first DLC with the hammer as kind of like in that routine. But unfortunately, you can't do it like that. Uh, I was going to ask. I said you couldn't go back and do it. No. Okay. Uh, each DLC is self-contained in terms of Got you. where you're at with it. But yeah, like Got I would you. say that if you want to play more Doom Eternal, the second DLC I think is far superior. The first one is if you are like, well, I found the game easy on Nightmare, and I want to make things harder. You know, <laughs> I want Nightmare's Nightmare. Let me play Those like that. Those people do exist. Yes, they, they do. They do exist. <laughs> <laughs> for sure so as we move forward is there anything else from doom eternal before we kind of jump a few more years you had the double jump at the start oh yes so which that technically was, makes it a metroidvania as well makes it a metroidvania yeah other than that um uh really great animation i think we talked about that awesome set pieces oh yeah wrote collectibles are awesome um oh the music. Um, mm -hmm. If we talk about the music, just shortly, um, Mick Gordon having a, a death metal choir, I thought was pretty interesting, mm -hmm. and it really added to the atmosphere. And if you and if you uh, listen to the actively listen to the sound while you're playing, there's like the the song is underneath without all of the riffs, and as soon as you get into combat, it crescendos up and adds mm -hmm. like heavier riffs. And then it eases back down and it's like very natural and it's and it's cool. So um, uh, it's like a metal Zelda esque thing. So mm -hmm. that's also very commendable. Other than that, I think that's that's pretty much it. What are we on to more boomer shooters? I don't know. These we're getting to like it's going to get a Call little weird Duty. now. Yes. Yeah, in terms of Call of Duty. Yeah. yeah. Um, before we move on to Doom Eternal, like my favorite song I think was they, the only thing they fear is you yes. from Doom Eternal. Yes. And Sadly, I heard that a whole lot of falling out happened between Mick Gordon and Bethesda. There was a huge lawsuit with them, like withholding uh, royalties and paying him as like the problem was really, I think, one of the managers at Bethesda who kind of screwed him over for the soundtrack. Oh my gosh, that's I I think yeah I think that wasn't that happening around the same time as the uh, Nintendo voice actress. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the one who did Bayonetta, whose name yes, I do Bayonetta. not remember. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, that was definitely a huge again, like a red mark against Bethesda to go after a McGordon like that. I mean, such an egg that's such. I could you imagine the game with like I don't know a much more tepid audio? Mm -hmm. It would. It would. I'm not saying it would make the experience different, but it it solidifies it and makes it holistically work right. And if you take mm -hmm. off something as important than that. You know, so you treat your devs well, please. Mm -hmm. And like the opening of Doom Eternal is like one final, final point. Like the actual opening cutscene yes, is yes, one I of my favorites as well. Yes. Yeah, I wrote that down. I was like, should I say that? But anyway, the cutscene is amazing. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. So I'm glad you agree on that. <laughs> I was like, I said, maybe that's too easy, low hanging fruit. But yeah, it's coolest scene ever. Um, mm -hmm. It's really great. And, um, the way and i think if you watched their like like uh or if you listen to the tenants and everything that they were trying to do in their vision they really follow through on everything that they were trying to do in the game and really stuck to their tenants and it all worked very well um touch on the story or we can just go ahead story was eh. i think this is where a lot of people can make fun of doom eternal for like they have yeah. you know eight paragraph descriptions of lore for how something works and they're just like 
I just won't go over there and hit this thing with a chainsaw. Do I really need to know about the 50-year process to make the super shotgun? Or yeah. what was the explanation to attach a grappling hook to a shotgun? Although that is, I think, a really important question to answer. It is. It is a question. Definitely. It is a question. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, yes, oh, it. man, we get onto like conversation about lore. I have so many thoughts on that. I think that is definitely too big to get into. And I think with a Tomo with Epic Tavern talking about like lore and storytelling, I mean, that, that could be like a four-hour conversation with the three of us. Definitely. Um. Oh, one last thing about Doom Eternal, because it's such a great example. What do you think of the difficulty setting design in that game? I thought they did a really fantastic job of balancing the game around, what was it, uh, easy, normal, horror, and then nightmare, and then ultra nightmare. So, I guess five different difficulties. Yeah, um, I did not, of course, play on, like, ultra ultra nightmare or any of that, Um <laughs> But the but from what I have heard and and how they did design it from the, the, the difficulties I did play mm-hmm. at, it seems they got it right uh, mm-hmm. because a lot of difficulties are what they simply like up the the damage numbers mm-hmm. and and just like that. But I believe that it worked very well. Uh, I know from your playthrough that you can assume you you would attest that it was excellently balanced. Correct? Yeah, I believe the difficulty affected the aggressiveness of the AI, and I think could affect the damage i don't know for sure but the one thing it did not affect were the enemy groups like you fought the same enemy waves on easy that you did on ultra nightmare and i thought that was a really great way of designing it because it was one of those games where i think a lot of people felt like you know if i could play this on normal maybe i can bump it up to hard and very few games do that like very few games feel like you can actually feel yourself getting better at them. And for people watching this live record, I would like to know what difficulty did you end up beating Doom Eternal on if you did play yeah. it? What difficulty? Oh man, I, Vince, if you're here, what difficulty? <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. Um, and and that's the thing is that is that games, especially you know, like you were talking about indie games, get it really bad. You know, they'll just throw more enemies, mm-hmm. uh, throw more more HP, reduce your the amount of health you can get, you know, like go about it the wrong way instead of giving you a sense of mastery like you're talking about. Um, so indeed. Mm-hmm. So with that, let's move on from Doom Eternal. We have another Doom Eternal I'd like to discuss in the next few minutes. But as we get into the 2020s, we saw this is when we began to see not only games starting to emulate Doom Eternal, but kind of this rise of boomer shooters and the last three years has definitely been this kind of like almost like the phoenix rising from the ashes of modding for shooters and using gc doom and other software to actually create you know the second not secondary uh full conversion mod slash games uh, I played that uh, Metroidvania Vomitorium from last year, and uh, there was a place earlier in this year as well. And we've been seeing a lot of developers. I think if Doom Eternal and the likes of New Blood have done anything, it's I think they've really given a lot of any developers the motivation to make an FPS. Definitely. I mean, and you can see it. And, and if we are talking about like boomer shooters right now and and the things that indies are able to do right able Mm -hmm. to be agile um and also due to the uh you know the requirements that may have or or the lack of funding you have to go other ways and like it allowed them to focus on the most important things right and like so for example if you play i don't know what games we're going to bring up first but for example if you play dust or ultra Mm -hmm. kill the first thing that you're going to be blown away with is the mechanics and the gameplay, right? How well it feel, how good it feels to move around as that character. It's literally amazing, right? Mm-hmm. And that, and and literally taking what worked, right, from original shooters, what you know, something from Quake or something mm-hmm. from Doom, what things that worked, polished it, changed it, add things to it, um, remove things that don't matter, like. For example, if I am an indie developer 
And I only have, am I going to spend all my time programming how the character controls so he feels mm -hmm. good? Or I'm going to spend that 100000 on graphics that doesn't really matter, right? It's like, mm -hmm. it's, what are you going to do? So clearly, they they understood that the gameplay, it, this proves that gameplay is king, right? And and it's just, it you know, the stripping down of it, everything. So I think that there was a malaise of shooters eventually that came up. Everything was looking a certain way starting to look very homogenized and this was kind of a backlash to it right to show mm -hmm. you like none of that's really needed like we don't even need multiplayer actually uh the, we we're just gonna go single player and we're gonna focus on what makes a shooter a shooter and uh i actually um like spent mo uh during my dev time this week and the schools trying to play as many Boomer shooters as I can, boomer shooters. I'm not a big fan of the name as I could. And I was blown away by the crea creativity, the mechanics, and the things that the indie developers were able to come up and do. And it really proves, again, that gameplay is king. Um, so, other than my rambling, Josh, what do you got to say to that? <laughs> well, I think, like, speaking about games getting derivative, we can certainly touch on kind of where the triple A shooter went in the last three to four years. As we saw, if you remember that brief period when everyone was trying to make a Fortnite. Yes. And I mean, literally, everyone was trying to make a Fortnite. I think one week, and I just got like 15 different emails from any developers saying, hey, we're working on this latest game based on Fortnite. Or this is another building game like Fortnite. Hey, have you heard of Fortnite? We're making a game like Fortnite. And now yeah. it's all Vampire Survivor Lakes, but we were not talking Vampire Survivor yeah. Lakes today. But Yeah, that, that's another round table. You can go yes. back and check it out. Exactly. But like the twenty tw like twenty twenty to like where we're at today, I mean even before that, it feels like the triple A mark. And we kind of when we get to the end of this episode, we'll talk more about the future of the genre. But for the AAA side, it feels like they really embraced the multiplayer shooter. You have mm -hmm. Call of Duty with its uh, Battle Royale mode. You have hero shooters like Overwatch. You even have stuff like with Apex Legends. And it didn't feel like the AAA side of shooters, other than, of course, it has really done anything in the space. No, no. And I, I believe they've kind of like pushed themselves into a box too, in a way, because um, due to like, you know, how how the businesses are run through shareholders and excessive, like it's a lot harder to take, uh, you know, a jump on another IP or something new. Mm -hmm. They're just going to have to do the same thing and do the same to keep it safe and to try and keep profits up. So um I don't think that you're going to see any innovation in in that realm in the AAA space. I don't really think it's possible. It would it would have to take it would have to take like an indie, a really big indie blowing up, and then possibly someone pitching it to uh, a triple A's. Hey, look, this is the new thing or something. But other than that, I don't really see an advancement, and we haven't seen any. And to me, it's almost like it's almost as stagnant as like sport games to me in a way. Now, the way that AAA shooters are, there's nothing different. There's nothing new. It's like tell me the difference between Apex Legends and Valorant. Or <laughs> there's, I mean, seriously. It, it's it's really hard to like differentiate between any of the shooters what stands out they almost look the same they went from brown to now everything's cell shaded um and again it's 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 all multiplayer uh base and we've talked about this before is that not everybody wants to play a multiplayer game right so you're also like avoiding a large a large part of your audience some people just want to play solo right you know they would like a solo version of it or to do that you know they have the apprehension of being multiplayer um so i don't know i don't know but anyway yeah and like i can tell you that i have no any in inclination or any thought about playing valorant i i, I really do not want to touch that game I, I i messaged you earlier i was like yeah i'm gonna update fortnite and play it so i'm so i'll be well rounded i didn't i didn't update uh, it i didn't play it so <laughs> all right <laughs> we'll let you off the hook this time thank you thank you <laughs> yeah and like the whole multiplayer shooter again it's been a genre that it has felt very stagnant 
over like the last four to five years. As I've said, I cannot, I have not bought a Call of Duty game since the original Call of Duty. And right. the last time I played a Call of Duty game, I, I don't even remember. I guess when's the last time you played Call of Duty? I don't remember. <laughs> For I don't anyone remember. watching, when, does anyone remember when they does played it? Does anyone Shadow remember a Call no. of Duty? <laughs> and it was it was amazing. It's amazing because like it was like um the standard. It was it was the game. Everybody played that game, uh almost akin to Guitar Hero, right? And then just I don't know, it, it almost seems like it, it seems like people have turned against it in a way. And if you still play it, like you're not, I don't know. You're not cool. I don't know. Does it, it does. It, what, what happened to it? It just too stagnated. And I think it's just such a good example. Like the AAA machine. Just yeah. Taking the same idea and doing the same thing again and again and again with it. Mm -hmm. And I guess like as a, both as a tangent, I think an interesting topic when about first person shooters. What do you think about the whole hero shooter style? Because I just, I mean, I play Team Fortress, I liked Team Fortress, but I just do not like the idea of a hero show. Like, something about it just doesn't feel right to me. No, I, I'm with you there too. Uh, I'm not big on hero shooters and. Uh, so I did, you know, Team Fortress. I probably spent more time in a hero shooter in Overwatch. And to me, like, it always felt like, okay, because we're each a shooter, we're each a hero and we're different. Um, it, it always felt like you were never evenly matched or you were always missing something out. Mm -hmm. And even even if, like, you had a utility or whatever, uh, your other teammates didn't have utility. It created toxicity. Um mm -hmm. You know, it was like, know your role, bro. And like, mm. and it's like, I don't know. I just picked the hero for the first time. I don't even know. And, and it, so it's like, uh, it, it wasn't to me, it's not like the best, you know, shooters are probably not the most like comforting, fun environments to be in, but like, it seemed to create more toxicity than anything. And I think people would, would say the same thing about the current environment in TF2. Right. Uh, so uh, I'm not very big on them. I, I, I think that it's, again, when we're talking about um, competitive, especially competitive shooting and things like that, things need to be uh, a little more even. Uh, you know, you're just, everybody has the same abilities and, and that's it. And while that might seem boring, it's for more competitive and more stuff. As far as hero shooting, uh, I, 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 I'm no, I'm, I'm going to have to pass on that, Josh. <laughs> you? Yeah, I mean, like, Overwatch, I mean, they're, like, the nicest people who play that game. They're Super up there with, nice. with League of Legends and Dota as, you know, very supportive of you if you miss a shot or if you, you know, uh, leak a kill or you miss that last hit on that mob. You know, they don't complain about that at all. It's I, all I, just like that Ubisoft uh, E3 video, them like, playing, like, one of the multiplayer shooters. You know, that's, that's how right. everyone is like when they play these games. It's like a Hallmark Channel movie. There we go. Was that on... That was on the stream? Was that on the stream we watched? No, this was, like, a few years ago when they first, like, unveiled, like, Rainbow Six Siege. That's right. I had the new uh, Hallmark movie pitch. Uh, lowers falling in love playing Rainbow Six Siege. There you go. There you go. Perfect. Come on, Hallmark. I'll I'll direct that for you. <laughs> love it, man. Yeah, yeah, I know. I I I have a. I keep a messages people have sent me in Overwatch mm -hmm. after you know I I mess up and I read them every night before I go to sleep just to feel better about myself. Mm -hmm. So, and if you're looking for a loving environment, there's where you need to go for sure. Mm -hmm. And I think to your point about, like, it felt like a lot of these games are really trying to brute force the competitive esports side into that. I know a lot of people complain about that with the differences between Overwatch 1 and Overwatch 2. Yeah. If, yeah. And I have not played Overwatch 2 at all. I have played maybe a sum total of an hour and a half of Overwatch 1. Like, I have very little play in that one. Oh geez, yeah, I have I have uh, a little bit more, maybe closer to like 50, 60 hours in it. I spent a little, I got a little addicted to it for a little while, and but I was playing on the console, so it wasn't as toxic. It was at the very beginning, so like nobody knew what they were doing. Yeah, and uh, yeah, 
and then they all figure out what they were doing and then Then they figured out and that was it i was out man (laughs) (laughs) and yeah like the problem for me with like the whole hero shooting like to your point is that it kind of loses like it combines like that kind of like weightlessness that we talked about with like arena shooters i think like this like three episodes ago but now you combine it with characters with all kinds of crazy powers that unless you're playing the game daily and you know exactly what to do, yeah. it was the same as anything that really started to uh, drive me crazy with League of Legends. It's like, oh, there's this character. I'm going to go shoot him. Wait, why are there orbs surrounding him? Oh, the orb just hit me. Now I'm stunned and take 80% more damage and I'm dead. Yeah. Or, you Should've know... Known. Yeah, Should or or you're playing games, you always see, like, you hear someone shout, and you see this, like, giant dragon come from behind the wall and one-shots you. It's like, okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So unless you're, like, unless you're into meta daily every day about the game, yeah, that's the kind of experience that you will have. And again, like, that's, that's the downside about competitive gaming mm-hmm. um, is that, you know, hopefully matchmaking will again we've i think we've talked about this before but like there's so many different variables about correct mac matchmaking and stuff um uh, uh, the giant <laughs> dragon yeah goes through the walls <laughs> there's so many different you know problems with competitive matchmaking that you know it has to be like how many wins how many people that are there etc and it has to be fair for it to work and um and then you know because it it's not fair you know put like in a fighting game like we were talking about in the fighting Mm -hmm. game you know i have two million wins and then i'm fighting (laughs) against someone who has zero right and it's like what are you gonna do and and so then you create that type of environment and you're not pulling people into the game um you know there 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 should be better ways to explain it but yeah like i don't know how many characters does dota or low have now like 400 500 so i don't know there's a lot you have to read before you even get jumping in the game right so Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that's the issue with that. Yep. And, it, again, I think it's why, like, for us here, like, we prefer, like, the single-player shooters where you're free to have, like, very spiky, very different ways of shooting that would never fit in a competitive shooter. Imagine, you know, five people playing a shooter like Doom Eternal and the amount of, like, bandwidth that have to go into... You know, this character is dashing up a wall and shooting the meat hook and grappling. This one's doing the super shotgun arborless railgun combo. Your a ISP. server just exploded right <laughs> as I'm talking about this. Yeah, your ISP would call you up. What are you doing? <laughs> Servers are melting. Yeah. <laughs> you bad. Bed, 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 bedlam. <laughs> you just uh, went through like 10 terabytes of uh, <laughs> your coverage this month. <laughs> we're going to have to. Yeah, that's it. We're going to cut you off. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I would do that. I would cause an entire server outage on the East Coast from Comcast. <laughs> Josh sure. plays shooter and stream shuts down internet on the East Coast for five hours. Front page, yeah, yeah. front page, man. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to take this back to the independent side, so over the last few years, we've seen developers been doing some very interesting things. Like one thing that I thought was very interesting was the we're seeing like rhythm. Base shooting, or are we seeing more mm. games built on using rhythm, which is horrible for someone like me, but for musically inclined people, it's definitely been a fantastic uh, avenue. Did you have a chance to play either BPM or Metal Hellsinger yet? I did not. Um, I I saw I was watching when they were first announced, and I was like, oh my gosh, that's so that is genius! It is so genius. Like it makes sense. Like if you just abstract it from like the super hot point, right? Mm-hmm. And then and then put that together with music and makes it. I did not get to play them. Uh, did you play them? And if you did, what did you think of them? I thought they were interesting ideas. I am absolutely terrible at. With uh, Mel Helsing, I took the developer's advice. And I turned off like all like the uh, beat timing and all the um, like latency things, and I just try to keep it as a heartbeat. And that made it doable, but doable again in air quotes so i didn't manage to beat the game on the highest difficulty yeah but like you can only you can only do ddr josh that that yeah DDR is your- <laughs> there's a 24-hour stream 24-hour ddr stream here <laughs> we'll see so i mean it's kind of like what was it crypt crypt of the necrodancer yes like kind of like that okay yeah mm-hmm. and i was hard i could not play crypt of the necrodancer like i am terrible yeah. at that one 
Yeah. And even me as a musician, I was like, I'm kind of bad at this. Like, I'm not really good at even even being a musician. I'm not very good at, at musical games. I don't know. You just yes have to have that sixth sense of it of the musical games. <laughs> and you mentioned Super Hot a minute ago, and that is something that we did not cover. Oh my god, Super Hot came out in 2016. I'm feeling even older now at this point. But yeah, like the idea of having more like almost like a tactical like strategy shooter i think is an interesting idea like where you can slow things down you can properly plan your moves out is certainly another avenue that developers can go and we've seen i think with the likes of doom eternal boomer shooters and so on that developers are trying to add more like we've talked about like you know this plus a roguelike we're now seeing you know this plus a shooter mm-hmm and that, I think, is a very great idea. And again, it's something that we can never see out of the AAA space. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, like, um, when, I mean, considering the future of, of shooters, I think that, like, genre fusion mm-hmm. or genre, you know, is going to is gonna be one, a very important for it, like, to expand. Like, things that you'll, again, like, the the um, uh, the, the, the beat, beat-based shooting and stuff like that or things like Super Hot. You know, you'd never see those in 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 AAA. Uh, so there's definitely going to be a lot more. You know, there there will be. I think you said deck building rogue rogue like FPS. Yeah, something that. like that. We could yeah, do. yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. So like, someone will pull that off, and it will work. And I guarantee you, someone will figure it out how to work, how it will make it work. Hopefully, maybe, and then you know, go from there. But I think that that's definitely uh, uh, one of the future things that Indy's going to be able to do. Uh, for the shooting genres complete complete evolving it involving triple a stagnates and malaises and capitalism (laughs) yeah but i think one of the big things about how like shooters can change is again like how much actual skill is going to be necessary like Mm -hmm. if you're playing Mm -hmm. a game like ultra kill that we'll talk about next it is you know up here in terms of learning fps play but mm-hmm. let's say you have something that's more rhythm based. Let's say you have something that could be more of a roguelike. A gunfire reborn, I think, is perhaps one of the most standout examples in this respect. The shooting is maybe like here. Like you need to be good, but you don't need god level FPS skills at. It. And being able to design FPSs that have these different skill levels and different audiences is a really great thing. We need more like Metroidvania style fpss we need when are we going to get the indie take on metroid prime does anyone know that one in chat <laughs> no no one knows yet when you know let us know in chat comments or chat mm-hmm. and it is a, again like as we've been seeing more indie developers experiment again more developers i think being confident in doing boomer shooters retro shooters um the GC Do mod, or just any kind of like uh, conversion mod games, has been very key to kind right. of like this rise of the genre. Right. So, okay. So, w- w- earlier when you were talking about the devs emailing you, said, oh, this is like Fortnite. We're making a game like Fortnite and things like that. Key thing for indie developers developing games is you're not a triple a studio right that is you need to understand you're not a triple a studio so the things that they're pulling off are far from your reach or budget right so what do you have to do you have to think about how you like uh what is the saying some of the best recipes are made because of lack of whatever you don't have the ingredients there's the same or like necessity is the motherhood of invention there we go necessity is the motherhood of invention right so due to that now you have to invent and come up with ways go back and what really works and think about things to change what you can do what you can affect what worked and like chasing chasing your for like working on an fps and trying to make it like a triple a experience is like a massive massive folly right like you're gonna like the assets alone will murder your budget, right? You're not even going to figure out how to like, even like make your gun shoot before you've spent all your money on your assets and everything like that. Right. So like, you have to like be very uh, considerate about where you're allocating your assets. Like I mentioned earlier, instead focus on your character controller, 
focus on things that matter, how your character feels moment to moment, that's way more important because like, as we're going to talk about soon, the most amazing thing about ultra kill is like literally moving around, jumping around, strafing left and right. Like, like that is like, if it looked amazing, what, if it looked really good, would that change anything? I mean, performance, it will probably blow like, up a computer if it looked like the computer. Right, it would blow up a computer. Right. I mean, what is it? So, so then again, why would why why as an indie developer are you going to be changing, chasing like triple A standards of shooters? I want to make a multiplayer battle royale. Please don't. Also, nobody wants to play one anymore. Right. And then you're probably not going to be able to make the best one. So anyway, my rant's over about that. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. So what you're saying is that your next game you're going to be making World of Warcraft meet Star Citizen, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And it'll be done in like what, three months? You know, three months. Four months maybe. I'm actually I'm actually shooting for like a month and a half and then we'll beta test it about two months and then release it, you know. There you go. <laughs> Again, you just you hit those auto build buttons on Unity and on Real, yeah. and it does like eighty percent of the work for you right there. Yeah, I I stopped tweeting. I you know I stopped using Twitter a little bit, but maybe I'll use it again and just let people know about the buttons. There just you go. Just let them know. <laughs> and yeah, so let's talk a little bit more about Ultra Kill, and then we'll kind of get into like the final phase or final okay. step about talking about like where the future is going to hold. Gotcha. So. As we've said, like, New Blood, over the last, like, five years, they have been, well, like, killing it in the independent space. They've, in very short time, like, as far as, like, any developer have, has gone, they have put out, like, hit after hit. They are really great at social media. Again, like, if you follow Dave Oshry or David Zeminski on Twitter, it's just constant hilarity, at least <laughs> three times a day from them. But one of the things they've done really well has been just really, like, lasering in some really great mechanics with their games. You, you mentioned a minute ago about how an developer can focus on the gameplay. They can focus on the feel, and who cares if their game is pixel art, or if it's, you know, PlayStation 1 or 1994 quality or aesthetic. I, again, I think uh, Dave Walsh, when I talked about it, he said, well, people can play, just say, screw them. <laughs> like, like right. that's his motto there. And again, it allow when you're not striving for super fidelity in terms of your games, it means you can invest in other aspects. Right. And Ultra Kill is one of those games that really nails that, or shall I say, quadruple gun shoots that point home. <laughs> Definitely. Like, um, if you haven't played it, play it. Um, it is, um, I would, I, man, I, I'm, I'm hard to press to say that I, like, if you're going to compare like older shooters that it's probably like the, almost the pinnacle of like how a shooter could like, of that genre should control and move, um, and how, how expressive the character is, mm-hmm. um, and it, it's really good at that, um, yeah. And I've said, like, it's very much like an action game built as a first-person shooter rather than a first-person shooter built as an action game. Indeed. It feels, it is incredibly interesting and challenging to move around in that game. It's a game that features, you have double jump, wall jump, you can parry bullets, you have every gun that has different abilities. You can do dashing in it. You unlock a grapple that you can use to either pull yourself to enemies or pull them to you. It's definitely the pinnacle of push forward combat. I think no other FPS we've played, even Doom Eternal, I think right. has that same level of if you stand still, you are dead. Like if you ever just like stand still for like half a second, they all just yeah. come down I'm- on you. I, I was I was standing still trying to figure out do I parry now do I parry now? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, man. Um, um, actually, playing I played both of them back to back. I played Doom Eternal and Ultra Kill back to back, and and not gonna lie, Ultra Kill I think feels better. Like I, I just think it does. Um, and, and and as far as like flow and 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 just overall, I, I don't know. I might give it to Overkill. Maybe that's just my bias. What do you th- What do you think, Josh? 
Yeah, I, I mean, think I think Ultra Kill it feels better paced than Doom Eternal yeah, by the definitely. fact that it is so much. I think Ultra Kill is far more demanding than Doom Eternal, and I think it kind of works in that game's favor. That it's a game that has a very high skill floor. But much like a lot of the games we've talked about, once you get past that, then it's just, it's time to show off. Now it's just time to get, you know, triple S ranking, ultra kill rankings. I've watched videos of people who can just, like, demolish bosses. Like, I saw someone, like, they throw, like, all four coins in the air, immediately swap to the railgun, shoot the coins with the railgun. It all magnifies the railgun blast that come down just deal, like, half a bar of the boss that's held in, like, a quarter of a second. Jeez, man. Yeah, the skill level in that game is amazing. Um, like, I just highly recommend it. Um, and it's a very, just again, like it's a very good study. Uh, we talk about games to study. This is a game to study for sure. And in, in pacing and, um, you know, like simplicity, not overcomplicating things, making things that matter, matter the most. Right. And, and um, using what they have to their best ability, like it, it is so good at all of those things. And again, I just I cannot like say how good it feels to play that game. And so, like, if you're unsure, like if you're unsure of how a shooter should feel or move or like what the capabilities are or, or like where the ceiling is at this point, that's a good part play to start and start to study at. Mm hmm. And the boss designs. We talk about the issues with the boss designs in Doom Eternal. This game does not have those issues at all. These no. bosses are going to test you. If mm -hmm. anyone who fought Gabriel, the like Gabriel fight, again, like they draw so much homage to Virgil from Devil May Cry 3, and it holds up in terms of fighting uh, Gabriel. And I think one of the things this game does exceptionally well it avoids that kind of, like, railroaded nature of Doom Eternal. Remember we were talking about how Doom Eternal is very much, you have to constantly be thinking, oh, I need to use this gun to fight this yes. enemy, then use this gun to use this one, this one hits him. This game, it kind of puts it all on you to figure out cool combos. So there's never an enemy that just says, haha, I'm immune to shotguns because I'm right. the anti-shotgun enemy. It's right. more about okay, these enemies are really scary and bad, I have a Gatling gun, rail gun, and my, uh, you know, parry punch, how do I make this work? Eat and that rat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, the Gabriel fight is such a really good example of it. Like, it's like, one of the things about the boss fights in Ultra Kills, they either go, re they go really fast, because either... You just demolish that boss in 40 seconds, or it demolishes, or it demolishes you in maybe 3 milliseconds. Again, right. like if you try to stand still when a boss is doing his attacks, your health bar goes from here to there in like a millisecond. Definitely. Yeah, and, and like you were saying, you know, like I, there was many times and I was like, wait, is this shotgun going to be effective against this guy? Oh, it is. Every, mm -hmm. Everything everything still kind of works you know there's there's none of that um i guess like a combo sekiro type system mm -hmm. or or like we were talking about in, in doom eternal and so like regardless of what you're using it's up to you to decide so it's a lot of freedom of choice uh and a great design choice yeah mm -hmm. now i will say if you thought if you thought doom eternal was button heavy Ultra Kill is probably a few steps above that. Like, there is right. a, a lot of things going on in that game. Yeah. Again, we even mentioned you have a ground pound. That you can yeah, use a pound. slam on enemies and then bounce ground them up, pound. and then you can shoot them in the air. And yeah. I was watching, like, a uh, streamer who was covering Ultra Kill, and one of the things I found very intriguing is that they were talking about the actual, like, numbers of, like, how weapons and stuff work. And the game features very low number design. Like, your yeah. pistol does two points of damage. The charge mm -hmm. shot maybe does four points of damage. Mm -hmm. And it's such a, like, a mind flip when we talk about other shooters, where it's like, okay, the rocket launcher does 645 points of damage, and your machine gun does 22.36. And I think a lot of the balancing that went into that game worked because they focus on small numbers. And as we've said, right. small numbers can be far more impactful. Going right. from 
you know, two points of damage to five points of damage is a huge deal. Yeah, actually, like the current uh, shooter that we're working on, Rooster Rampage, the damages are like that one damage, two damage, mm -hmm. keeping it really low because uh, eventually, like, you get to a point where you just, like, the numbers don't matter. It's just, mm -hmm. I, I can't even tell if that was 6,000 damage or 600 damage anymore or six. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that matters. What does that even mean? And eventually, like, a number squish is way more important and way more impactful, right? Um, yeah. I remember uh i had a friend years ago playing wow and he was like dude like we're doing like 60 million thousand hits of damage i was like and like they were literally requesting them to reduce the number like please give mm -hmm. us a number squish so it makes it, it means something right so yeah so definitely that is 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 a really good uh, for balancing right like okay if you do if how hard is it to balance like uh, you do a thousand zero to a thousand damage and you need to balance all of this or you do max five damage right mm -hmm. i mean much more easier to to, to balance a zero to ten so just think about it in that way and it, and that is a very good example um yeah. of of balancing mm -hmm. and it makes it again a lot more easier to do interesting things yep. if every gun had does between 20 and 7 million points of damage why will i ever take a gun that only does 22 points of damage when i have you know my super quadruple shotgun rocket launcher sniper that does 6 billion damage but again if a gun does two points of damage versus a gun that does three points of damage well let's say the two damage gun can also slow enemies or it freezes exactly. them it feels better and it incentivizes you to use more of your inventory. And that is something that Doom Eternal and, of course, Ultra Kill does in spades. It really makes you want to use these guns. Again, the coin is like one of the most brilliant examples. You flip the coin in the air and then whatever gun you shoot it with next does enhanced damage. I actually saw someone, this is something I couldn't even believe. I had to like stop and think for a second. They were using the pump shotgun. And what they do, they would shoot the shotgun, they would punch at the same time. So you're punching the shotgun blast at enemies as kind of like your own like mini Hadouken to do what? even more damage. And it's like, this is where we get to like almost like immersive sim territory or emergent game design in terms of designing these tools. I'm going to have to try that. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't think I can time it right, but I'll try. Me neither. I'm I'm terrible at the parry window in the game. I mm. need to get better at that. And you really do need to get good at that if you want to beat the game on the highest difficulties. Yeah. But as a quick time check, we are about an hour and 22 in. So I think let's talk a little bit more about the future. And this will be kind of like our final topic for tonight. Is there, is there anything else you want to cover in terms of the other shooters? Um. Okay, let's see here. I have... Um, we already talked about Dusk, right? Mm -hmm. And Spec Ops. Uh, let's see here. I was just going to see from... Oh. Okay, so from... Let's see. Okay, no, I think that covers it up. Let's go ahead and just talk about the future then, yeah? All right. So the future is both, I think, positive and bleak at the same time, depending upon who you talk to. Yeah, uh, where, where, where you get your information from. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, to Rat's Tail Portal, I don't know if I would call P Portal the same like first-person shooter. I, think, I feel it's more of a first-person puzzle, which first that is puzzle. its own uh, can of worms to get into. Mm. But the thing about shooters right now, and this was something I was talking with Thorn about. We were playing Back for Blood last night. And I was telling them, like, we're going to do the show today, talking about, like, the future. And we're both like, like, where, what, what is, is the future? Is like, future? what is actually coming? And it's a very tough question. Like, if you talk about the multiplayer side, multiplayer is either Battle Royale or Hero Shooter. Like, those are the only two things that exist right now in the multiplayer space. If we talk single player, then it's just basically Boomer Shooter or, you know, Ultra Kill, like, action-focused shooting. But are there any, like, new developments in terms of FPS design? Like, what do you think about this? I mean, okay, like, I think to, like, really analyze that question, we'd have to, like, look all the way back, right, like, from the starter shooters and, like, 
from then till now, like what has actually changed? And that might give us some information, right? And then we can infer like our current technology that we have evolving with AI, machine learning, et cetera, hardware advancements and stuff. And we can say, actually, I don't know, probably not much more, right? Sadly, um, I think that shooters have kind of almost reached like a uh, almost a stagnation, right? Because like now shooters, when we're talking about boomer shooters, we're literally going back to like the origins of shooters, right? It's not like a, it's not a forward progression of shooters. While it is like a, a chiseling down and a more, um, uh, a more purified uh, version of the genre to, you know, enjoy and understand it is not an advancement, right? So saying where the advancement from, I mean, geez, we need that crystal ball. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking of it, and the only things I can really think of are going to be due to, like, technological advancements, right? And, like, graphics, no. We're not even going to talk about graphics. Like, that's, that's not... Graphics will advance and things like that. Also, AAA needs to get their, um, their budgets <laughs> in order before they really start doing that so I, I i wrote a few notes down and the first like i mentioned this earlier but i think really the biggest thing that that's going to happen to the future is with genre fusion right i believe that's the only way that we're going to find some new way because i mean we've already done pretty much everything we pretty much thrown mmos at shooters right pretty much made mmo shooters like um I don't know what else you can do. Cooking shooters, fishing shooters, I don't know. But some type of genre fusion is, I believe, the only other one of the main ones, right? Mm -hmm. Also, also, I think that, okay, uh, I was thinking about the capabilities of, like, machine learning and AI. So what we would be able to do or possibly be able to do would be, like, more narrative branching storylines, right? And what mm -hmm. you could do is you can, like, you could take like global heat maps of like players playthroughs and what players are doing and like dynamically change content by learning players playthrough, right? Like we could take player samples from every steam player and what they're doing and adjust things accordingly. Like I, depending on if it's a game of service or depending if it's an offline game, either way, what to add, what they like, etc. So that might be, uh, there in the future or that might be for all games, right? Um, so, so definitely machine learning and AI for like narrative purposes, branching mm -hmm. storylines, stuff like that. And also just like advancements in like, uh, how enemy behavior works, right? You know, like we need to get far beyond believing that fear had the best AI, like of, uh, uh enemies of all time, or, you know, we, we, we're, we're far past that. And so we need to have enemies that um respond better and understand the environment and we're, we're, you know those things aren't evident yet so those are some advancements um let's see here maybe some vr stuff i have no idea where vr shooting would go to me <laughs> vr shooting is a little strange uh, a little odd but i'm sure there's many people that are looking into that so whatever vr can bring into the table um not too much to say about that and then, of course, just through hardware advancements in like networking, we can we can talk about more like seamless integration with people like dropping in and dropping out live, live shooter worlds, uh, more dynamic interactions instead of like setting up lobbies and going to things like that. We can have it more seamless, uh, asynchronous, asynchronous multiplayer things like that. Um, let me see here, and then maybe like dynamic environments again through like ai learning through machine learning things like that um develop heat mats about how pay players learn and play the environments maybe make subtle changes and things like that other than that um i'm really not sure josh you have ideas mm -hmm. yeah i think to your point about it being stagnant is i think a really important one it's kind of the issue we see with reflex driven games i think the shooter genre, I think, is very similar to that of platformers. That yeah. it's a genre that there's only so much you can do that is very skill-intensive. Yes, you can make a Kaizo 
you know, Kaizo on top of Kaizo game. Everyone would try and make a Celeste like or an Ultra Kill like. But that, you know, really destroys like the floor for a lot of people to try and get into the genre. And one of the things that we saw with the platformer side over the last decade was trying to do, as you were saying, like genre blending about adding in more Metroidvania aspects, adding in uh, score chasing or, you know, gravity puzzles and so on to it. And I think that, again, is where we will probably see more shooters. Like, one of the big trends we've seen, of course, is having more roguelike elements, making a shooter like Gunfire Reborn. Uh, let's see. Immersive Sim is another interesting answer. There are several Immersive Sim-style shooters that are in the works. Um, there is, of course, Gloomwood, and there is the other one whose name escapes me. It's like a space-themed Immersive Sim-style game. And, like, those are definitely ways to go, but they're not really moving the mechanics forward. But in the same breath, can you move the mechanics forward? Like, is there any more room to add more gun? Can we squeeze more gun yeah. into shooters these days? And I honestly don't know. Like, I, I think, like, again, like, something like Ultra Kill or Doom Eternal, like, at that level of push forward combat. I think that's as much you can do before you just overstimulate someone in terms yeah. of trying to play one of these games. Yeah, that's that's pretty much like the apex or like the tipping point, right? Where like after that, then it's basically unplayable and it's too much to manage and it's simply a mess. And uh, many times for me, uh, not as uh, uh, a pro shooter as as yourself, uh, I I was running into issues. Uh, so, you know, it's toward the end, some of the more you know, fights where it was, again, it was like an APM or like micromanagement uh, between swapping, right? And so I really don't know. I don't think you can just keep adding more guns. You can't just keep adding more mechanics because like you said, I think we've pretty much reached the apex of mechanics, you know, ground slams, wall, wall climbing, clambering, uh, mm -hmm. ch you know, uh, grappling guns, freezing. Uh, I, I'm not sure what else you can do and if you would like i don't know take a look at an action game for example um what more could you like what what more it could be added to an action game in that same respect like that you could add you know to a shooting game uh for example yeah i i think it's almost reach its genre stagnation point mm -hmm. and that's where it's going to be and one of that we saw with the actor genre was add more RPG elements. We've seen yes. gear rating systems and finding more loot and, of course, you know, the Souls-like style. And I think for me, I still would like to see someone do like a, almost like a Souls-like meets Doom Eternal. Like I want like a more grounded, not so much, I don't think I want to say grounded, but like more like every bullet matters kind of shoot. Like maybe like a Hunt Showdown meets you know, Bloodborne kind of game. I would love to, like, see something along those lines. Because, like we've said, like, at some point, it all just kind of blurs together, like, dozens and dozens of bullets all trying to do things. So why not make a game where just one bullet can really mean something? You know, like, if you hit me with a bullet, like, they actually, they're going to react much like you hit someone with a sword in Elden Ring. Right. I mean, like when you really come down to it, like one bullet is really all you need. Right. We mm -hmm. don't like making like we were talking about paring down the damage to like one damage, meaning a lot. Right. One bullet meaning a lot. And adding more makes everything quite a bit inconsequential. You're mm -hmm. like too much birthday cake. <laughs> and so instead, one slice of birthday cake and then you're good. You know, like uh pairing things down making things more simple i think uh is key in that respect mm -hmm. and i guess uh, to summarize or to kind of put our conclusion on this are there any big shooters coming out that you're excited about in like the next year or so no unfortunately not let me know if i'm missing one then hmm I think for me, the only ones I'm really interested in is seeing Ultra Kill hit 1.0 and uh, Gloomwood. Yeah, and, Gloomwood. Yeah, that's about it. And again, like the multiplayer side, I've uh, 
you know, I resign myself to not being interested in any more of those games. Yeah. I it, mean, I, I know there's like a, I'm not sure if the new Battlefield already came out, but I, I mean, I'm not, again, the multiplayer, you, you have to be, I guess, a certain type of player and really be into it. But yeah, those are not my bag of tea uh, when it comes to like fulfilling gameplay, right? It's just, I don't know. Mm -hmm. well, kind of uh, not 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 feeling multiplayer at all anymore. I, I we've we've had a, a lot of you know when did the multiplayer age happen? It was like maybe like two thousand maybe like late two thousands and definitely yeah. into the early twenty tens. Yeah, definitely. So it's been around for a while, and we've definitely experimented with a lot, and it's nothing new. Um, so that's probably why I'm not for, I, I'm looking way more forward to a fresh single player experience, something that I haven't experienced before. I've definitely experienced, uh, every type of better Royale situation or one-on-one -on -one or 2v2 or 4v4 situation. So, um, yeah, but I, I haven't, you know, before I played ultra kill, I never played something like that before that felt like that. So that's what I'm more interested in looking forward to. So yeah. Uh, one point of ultra kill and and gloomwood also uh, i'm trying to think i think um, most of the other ones have came out already that i was looking forward to so mm -hmm. uh, celico celico was, uh, was out already right yeah like, uh, uh, maybe demo is that the one that's kind of like uh do nukem forever like uh yes i think so hmm, i think they're in early access or they're out i'm not sure And yeah, it's going to. And I think, like, when I talked with David Zeminski, like. Yeah, it's on GZ Doom. Yeah. Like, we were talking about how, like, so many shooters have come, like, it's really flooded the market. And it's going to be, again, like, that tough sale of a lot of people think, oh, I'll just make the next Dusk. Or I'll make the next Ultra Kill. And they're not going to come anywhere near it. Again, much like what we're seeing with the Vampire Survivor Leaks. That even yeah. the ones that legitimately do something different are still going to be crushed under the weight of the game that kind of started or reignited the genre. Let me ask you then, just like a prediction. Um, do you see like now, like this boomer shooter time that we're at right now, do you see that after this, we're just going to see like a dearth of like, Boomer shooters that don't, you know, just like platformers that don't understand what was working, and then we're going to go into the dark ages of shooters again. Uh, I think it is quite possible. There are some very interesting ones. So Turbo Overkill is another one that's kind of like sci-fi cyberpunk ultra kill, which I thought was really well done. But again, it's that case of a lot of developers just trying to chase the same bullseye. And it's going to be very hard for these games to stand out, and I don't know how many of them are actually going to do it when the time comes. Even the ones that people are really excited about. Again, one of the big things is just how much of a difference between, you know, fandom and other people in the industry versus the mainstream market. Because you can see, like, a, you know, someone posts a GIF of Ultra Kill or some other shooter and it gets, like, so many results... But then, how many mainstream consumers know about these games? How many of them yeah. are actually going to find them? And I just don't know. Like, I played that Warhammer 40k bolt gun game last week, and it was good, but it did not do anything that I haven't already seen before. And again, it's very much like the platformer genre. Why should I play your version of Super Meat Boy or your Swapper or your Celeste? When I still have all these games over here that I can go back to. Yeah, indeed. But I think with that, I think that's just about all that I have for the subject. Any uh, other points from you before we kind of go into our conclusion? Uh, let's see here. No, I think that'll be it. Let's go ahead and jump into that conclusion there. All right. So to wrap up this massive talk about first-person shooting... It is a genre that has certainly come a long way, and a lot of what has led to the evolution has been combining it with other genres. About being able to have like a almost like a turn-based strategy meets shooter, like a tactical shooter. We've seen shooters that embody again action game design. And 
what I think the genre does really well, again, is that it represents some of the best reflex-driven gameplay. But conversely, reflex-driven gameplay has a smaller consumer base because it is so skill-intensive. And the developer who can kind of figure out how to square that circle of, here's a unique original shooter that you don't need uh, quake con levels of mastery in order to play could have something. Definitely. Uh, that's probably like the most limiting factor for a shooter, right? Like if I ask any per anybody, I don't know if I ask my, Hey, why food do you want to play this shooter? She'd be like, no, I'm just going to instantly die. <laughs> There's so, so like, I think that accessibility somehow finding some more accessibility in the shooter genre without lowering the skill cap, still allowing the skill cap to be there, mm -hmm. but more accommodating, I guess accommodating would be to uh, not as skilled, you know, QuakeCon level uh, would definitely be uh, the future in it um, mm -hmm. or be helpful. All I could say is I'm really, I'm really hoping that um, this boomer shooter uh that's happening is is not going to lead to a dark age and that we continue to this there's going to be a, a rebirth more of shooters and i want to see you know, uh, a growth out of stagnation um and uh and hopefully we'll see something move forward you know with the advancement of technology the availability we have for developers right now so hopefully there are people out there that are far more creative than i uh, that will come up with something great, and and that's all I'm hoping for there. Mm -hmm. uh, to Mel Winnie's comment, yeah, maybe like Final Fantasy VII meets a first-person shooter, like making R a true RPG JRPG shooter. Ah, Someone uh, there we go. coin that idea. We need to trademark that one. There and yeah, go. I would like we've said like there's only so much you can go on the skill side. So the genre infusion side thing is still very ripe. For interesting ideas. Again, stuff like Gunfire Reborn. I know, let's do Full Factorio meets Doom Eternal. There we go. There's, exactly. There's the combination for you. Push forward combat while doing a assembly line the logistics. Push forward Factorio. I there mean, we yeah, I, that's 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 definitely I think where we're where we're gonna need to see some advancements because you know adding some other genres to allow people uh you know m an easier entryway into a shooter because i know just the shooter genre itself can be off put you know off putting to people just be like nope skill cap too high for me mm -hmm. and like there you can be really great fun experiences one of my favorite genres and and um and even though I'm not that highly skilled, I love playing them, right? And I always have. And so they have a, a, a soft spot in my heart, and I want more people to enjoy them or for what they are. So, yeah, genre fusion uh, is definitely uh, something that will help it a lot uh, to get it in front of more audiences. Because like you said, I mean, who's going to be playing? Like, what grandma is out there playing Overkill? Maybe one or two, but... Uh <laughs> Mm -hmm. it's it's it, it's not it's not for that for that market and finding a shooter that that that's as accessible as candy crush right for the normal uh gamer would be uh definitely a high point right mm -hmm. and have a good night rat's tail yep and maybe oh. i'll post this on twitter after the uh, conversation see if i get any feedback from any developers but where they see things going because it yeah. is a very I know some people will just say, well, the shooter genre will never die and all that, but that's not the point. Yeah. It's about where else can you go with these mechanics? Yeah, and definitely not dying any anytime soon, no. Uh, wait, I have to say, as long as I'm a 10,000 subscriber YouTuber, so we have to have the clickbait. So all that's shooters right. are dying, the genre is dead, Ultra Kill killed it, and... That's right. And, no. and scene. And scene, yeah, no reason to make a game after another shooter after Overkill. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. So next, then you got to do we, more clickbait stuff. <laughs> there we go. All right, but I think that is a good point to end on with all the doom and gloom. So um, I have some barbecuing to do for Memorial Day weekend. I'm going to let everyone get back to their holiday. Will we be back at our regular time next Saturday around 5 p.m. ET? We haven't really figured out a topic yet. We've been talking about shooters for what seems like eight years now, so we'll need to figure out something yeah. else to discuss. 
Yeah, we've kind of been floating in the topic about 120 episodes to the end of the year for Souls, but mm -hmm. we'll see. Mm -hmm. So if you are new to all the YouTubing stuff, bell ringing, liking, be sure to visit our Discord and Patreon, follow me, all that great stuff. Yep, same thing for me. Leaks are down below. Uh, Rooster Rampage, Samurai Pig. Of course, Discord, buy some books, and be sh again, join the Discord, have a conversation with us, so that way uh, we can have a great conversation with you, and appreciate everybody's support, and mm -hmm. everybody have a great Memorial Weekend, for sure. Yep, and when my shooter book comes out, buy all the copies of all it. All the copies. You can uh, take them shooting with you. Just uh, <laughs> <laughs> use them as target practice, and you have to buy more books. It's perfect. I'll yes. include a bullseye on the uh, back cover for everyone to use. <laughs> but uh, thank you, Malwinius, and to everyone else in chat who's been enjoying things. Again, let us know what you think in the comments down below. Once again, have a great Memorial Day weekend, and come back for Dale Sessions on Game Design here and on Game Wisdom, where some of the art and science of games.